Ukrainian of American Symphony. Um, I am honored and privileged that I get to introduce my friend Matt Heineman today. I first met Matt with his fantastic film, Cartel Land, yeah. and uh, yeah, which was on my show, BYOD, so we met on a talk show. And I was just astounded by his courage and his clarity of filmmaking. Um, and it has been consistent ever since. We spent some really good times together last year on the road when he had retrograde and uh, I had last play at home and we were at Telluride together and really became good friends. And I was just, the intimacy that he brings to his subjects uh, is something that I really, really appreciate. We didn't joke that we would let each other edit each other's films one or shoot each other's films once in a while or try that experiment, and I would, he's probably the only filmmaker I'd do that with. Um, but uh, this film is really different um, from that, and I think it, it, I, in speaking with him, it's, it's a really beautiful sort of respite from the war zones that he covers with such uh, incredible uh, fortitude, I guess, of spirit, um, and his gentle lens. He brings this gentle lens to uh, some very, a very, um, how do I say it? It's like people who are on the precipice of a new chapter in their lives in totally opposite ways with John and, uh, and with his wife, I'm gonna select me. Select me? Select me. Um, and uh, it's just really a beautiful journey, a heart-wrenching journey and um, a masterful work, again, by Matt Heinemann. So without further ado, I welcome him to the stage. I have so much more to say to stay for the Q&A and reception afterwards, and, uh, and that film will be on Netflix on the 29th of November, so you're very lucky to be here seeing you there. Um, thank you so much, Andy. Um, thank you to Netflix, thank you to High Ground. Uh, it's such a dream to partner with you guys. Um, this film was definitely different than other films I've made. Um, I think I was just still down to one thing. It's a, it's a love story, and it's a story about um, art as a sort of survival mechanism during difficult times. So, um, yeah, thank you for coming, and you'll be here afterwards to chat. So, thank you again. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Ford from Vanity Fair. Thank you so much for joining us. This is that just incredible. Yeah. I'm very excited for the people to bring up, so I'm going to get to it. Um, I'd like to welcome director Matthew Heineman. <laughs> Producer Lauren Domino. You know him well now, John Baptiste. Film to work on. 
and then I, I was familiar with some of his other work, and then I looked at the other work that you did, and I was like, oh, wow. This is something that can be very special if we're vulnerable enough to give it and allow for an artist like Matt to, to really uh, do what he does best. So it was at a dinner about a month before we started shooting, we decided to shoot. <laughs> and um, now we're here. Matt, what was it about John's story? I mean, we see the proof, but at the beginning, what was it about their story that you felt like was right for a film? I think the, the original conceit of the film was um, just sort of process film following American Symphony, the creation of American Symphony, John was going to go out on the road and gain influences from different regions and different people, um, but life intervened and um, he got nominated for a lot of Grammys, she likely got sick again, um, another COVID wave came, and so all those plans are sort of scraps and we were forced to shoot in New York and you know like like most films I've ever made it changed and evolved numerous times as we're making. So what were those discussions like when you realized the story was going to be different than maybe what you two had first signed up for? Were there any hesitation? So I felt very hesitant to share the story again in part because I had told it in my book, I had told it in the series of all a recurrence, it's a whole other ball game. I wanted, um, I think as I always do anytime I venture into something that is first person uh, to ground myself in the bigger why. Um, I was not interested in some melodramatic Illness narrative, not that in the hands of someone like that, it ever would have been that. Um, but I needed to know why I was sharing this story and why we were opening up our lives in this way. And I think in this time of great suffering in the world, uh, it felt important to share the unvarnished truth of what it means when you're close to the veil, when you have been pushed to such an extreme, either by a creative endeavor or by an illness, um, and to show not just you know the American Symphony, but really the symphony of life that was unfolding behind closed doors, uh, with the hope that it might show what we've all had to do. Um, in these last couple of years, which is to learn to hold the brutally hard things with the astonishingly beautiful and, and wonderfully surprising things of life to the same all. And Lauren, when you, you know, were first getting to work on this, what did you sort of anticipate to be most difficult about your responsibilities? I mean, there are several. I think Matt, in his work, does a really good job of bearing witness to hard things. Um, and in that, helping us find and understand the community within ourselves. So automatically going in, I knew that there, there would be that task. And, and that bearing witness, it's a lot of veritation. Um, I wasn't around during the actual production, but we inherited 1,500 hours of footage of their lives, which they so graciously <laughs> let that be witness to in the good and the bad. So to have that much amazing footage, it was a challenge. Our biggest producing challenge was, what is this story? Because this is a film that could have been 11 different films and it impacted people in like 20 different ways and striking that balance of the beauty of their life, the like creation. That was the thing that we talked about so much in the edit of like, what does it feel like internally to make something? And how can we relay that so that an audience feels that too? Because the, their art making feel to me when I was watching the footage of like a huge means of getting through 
life and for it to have, to have an audience not just see that, but feel it, was our biggest challenge of life. Feel it in your belly, not just in your mind. So you're mentioning all this footage that you had. Matt, can you summarize uh, how much filming we're talking? I understand it was seven months. Was it all day, every day? <laughs> Sum it up for you. <laughs> we had that dinner and sort of decided to make the film. And I think, yeah, within like three or four weeks, started filming on New Year's Eve 2021. Um, and, and literally filmed every single day, seven days a week, uh, often getting up with John Archuleta and going to bed with them. Um, <laughs> sometimes 12, 16, 18 hours a day um, for a long time. So I, you know, I and we owe so, so much to them for having the bravery to open up their lives, their souls, their minds, their hearts, their marriage um, to us at such an unbelievably critical moment. And, you know, we all are the benefits of their courage to allow us to do so. Well, I think the feedback is like their courage and their just like true vulnerability forced us as a team to reach those places within ourselves, right? So it's like healing just doesn't happen in front of the screen, it happens behind it too. And that's the power of art, right? So it forced us to be like, how do we show up? to this footage also from a place of like supreme vulnerability and talk about things that are difficult that we're maybe going through in our lives that we're seeing reflected back in the footage. And so it was a really transformative process uh, that we couldn't do if they didn't so graciously and lovingly invite us to experience their lives with that level of openness. Um, so thank you. I will say, it wasn't always so gracious and loving. <laughs> it takes a lot. It takes a lot to have the presence of the, the, the crew, the team became like family. But, you know, it's one of those things where when we embarked upon filming, we didn't really know what we were fully signing up for. And then life shifted in the way that life does. And then it felt like a calling to continue filming. Because there's many moments where the duress of what this is, the way that Matt works, why he gets to that place in cinema is because there's a lot of hard road to try to get to that golden truth. So I just want to say I really appreciate that, but <laughs> I know I speak for both of us when I say it wasn't always easy to be as uh, to be as older. And we really, you know, we, we're grateful for your stewardship of our vulnerability. <laughs> Because as artists, I assume you have times when you need to be introspective, to be private, to be alone, and you didn't for seven months, basically. What would you do on days where maybe you wanted that and the cameras were still there? Hide in the closet, is that the end? You know, what's amazing is about a couple months in, I realized that very acutely. It was, it was a moment of, it was, it was almost a moment of crisis, I'll say, for me, in the process. And I realized I could go into the bathroom. And that's where I could go, where the cameras weren't tracking. But then the mic was there, and then yeah. one day, <laughs> I will never forget this. I was taking a shower. And then the door to the bathroom opens. And I see Thor with the camera. And he starts to negotiate with me mid-shower. And he's like, no, you know, Matt told me just to capture everything. And I was like, no, man, the bathroom, this is the shower. Like, no, Matt told me to capture everything. And I remember I looked at him and he was like, 
I'm not filming the little waist. <laughs> This is, it, it was so, I admired how brazen he was. And, and that just is like one of many stories of moments that you're talking about. But I think, I honestly believe this was something that God put in our life. This was something way bigger than us. It was something that, it, it's not about, it's way bigger than the idea of privacy or, 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 you know, I don't want them to see that I'm a celebrity. I don't, it, it, it's way bigger than that kind of discretion. And I'll just add to that. On the first day of filming, and maybe every day of the first week of filming, you know, I have been brought to my knees by the news of this recurrence. I was scared. I couldn't sleep, and I remember the first day Matt was coming over to our house, and I was in sweats, and I had been crying all morning, and I thought to myself, oh, I have to shower, and put makeup on, and put something cute on, there's going to be a camera here. And of course, you know, I had to check that impulse, because no one wants to be filmed when they are at their sickest, at their most vulnerable at their most laid bare. Um, but ultimately, the whole point of why I was participating in this was to show the truth of what it means to be in that liminal space, um, both the creative liminal space, but also that liminal space between the kingdom of the sick and the well. Um, and eventually, that impulse to present in a certain way um, started to fall away. That's the beauty of filming 14, 16, 18 hours a day. It's like exposure therapy. At some point, you just forget that it's there. Um, Matt, tell me about getting the access you needed. You know, we're in the hospital, we're backstage at the Grammys. What was the biggest challenge with getting the access you needed? Um, I mean, I think this is definitely one of the more the hardest produce, producing challenges in my career, just because we're constantly dancing with the madness of Don Sillier's life. And, you know, a lot of stuff was planned and we knew what was going to happen, and often things would just happen and we'd have to adapt. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was constantly sort of juggling opening doors that are often shut. And I think we all on the stage share this idea that magic, you know, exists behind every door if you just open it. And that sort of idea of believing in improvisation, improvisation of life and music, of love, um, that sort of dedication to that idea is what allowed us to sort of capture all these very vulnerable moments. And, you know, I think my goal always is to become far, part of the fabric of the daily lives of the people that I'm filming with. And that certainly happens here. And tell me, when you got to the editing room, and that's where you have to make this story take shape, was there anything that got left on the cutting room floor that sort of breaks your heart that's not in here? Oh, I mean, I'm not going to math, but 1,500 hours minus 93 minutes is a lot of footage. Um, you know, I think there's obviously filmmakers in here. I think a thousand different filmmakers would have made a thousand different films, literally up until like two months before we locked. Is this a series? Is this a feature? Is this a series? Is this a feature? Like, there's there's so many storylines that just we weren't able to include. Um, but you know, I'm really happy with the story that we ended up with, and I think it really distills the essence of what John was likely going through during this month, during this period of, of great highs and great lows. And I think it's very relatable. I think it's something that. I didn't want this to be a music film. Obviously, there's tons of amazing music in it, and like, it was such a privilege to be able to see John play every single day. But I wanted to be a film about two artists who are navigating these things, not just, you know, what is often sort of a cradle to grave music biopic. Um, I had no intention of ever making that.
And Ms. Lincoln, John, what was it like the first time you saw the film? Did you see it as it was being put together, or did you wait to watch it once it was finished? There was maybe one or two times that we got to see something, but every time it was different. So I think that at one point we were talking and it was also like, it's probably gonna be something completely different at the end. So <laughs> let's just wait and see. I think the feeling of, of watching yourself also is a form of exposure therapy. When you, especially when you're reliving moments that are so harrowing for you, it's like a physical reaction that you feel. You feel yourself and the sensory experience of what that was like. And that took a minute to even be able to watch. Not just to, uh, not just to see the film and understand what they were crafting, but to also be able to have a, a, a distance from it. Uh, you know, it's like milestones of life and moments of, of extreme pressure. So uh, there was that to factor in as well. I knew that when I watched uh, a first cut, I needed to do it alone. Um, and, you know, I was very sick for a lot of the footage. I was on a lot of medications. The morning of the wedding, uh, we had a virtual marriage license ceremony from the OR as I was getting a cord implanted in my chest. And, um, you know, they tell you not to make any big decisions 24 hours after anesthesia. Unfortunately, <laughs> 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 this is the best decision. Um, but I didn't remember a lot of the things that were in the documentary, and I needed to experience that myself, and to reacquaint myself with those memories, with those moments. Um, and I, unlike John, wanted to watch every cut that I possibly could, not because I wanted to control the process, um, but as a storyteller, it was sort of awe-inspiring to see Matt's editing prowess and all of the producers and how they were shaping this story week to week. Every week it was a different documentary. And so you say a thousand different filmmakers would have made a thousand different films. I feel like you did make a thousand different <laughs> films to get to this beautiful masterpiece. <laughs> Obviously, we know the two of you know each other so well and you're so bonded, but I'm curious if watching the documentary made you realize anything about each other that you hadn't maybe grasped onto before. Can I jump in? Okay. Um, you know, I think this weird thing happens when a family is in crisis. There's the inclination to put on a stoic brave face for one another, to be strong for each other. Um, and what you know really struck me were those things of John after he left the hospital, after I was no longer in the room, where you allowed yourself the permission to fall apart. Um, and it's so, um, in some ways, you know, I wish we could fall apart in front of each other, um, but it was it was so moving to me and um, really gave me a deeper appreciation of how when you go through something like this, it's not the person in the hospital that ends up suffering, it's everyone around them. And I was so grateful to get to see those moments to have a deeper understanding of what you were going through, what anyone who's been in the caregiver's chair might be going through. I have a greater perspective of how far we come, both as individuals and together. You know, we met when 
we were in the summer band camp, and you must have been 12 or 13, and I was 14. And to come through two bouts with this illness, seeing our house and our life and our friends and family, you get a perspective of how far we've come, and it really is uh, it's moving to think about what we as people, to your point earlier, what we can transcend, what we can survive, what we're capable of. We have a lot within us, we're made of a lot. And sometimes we forget what we've gone through. Sometimes we forget what we've actually been able to shoulder and, and all that we're the combination of. So to see that, both our relationship and us as individuals was a powerful testament to that. I think we're gonna wrap up soon, but I, I, after watching this, I think you can't help but care about both of your stories so deeply. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing an update about what's next as artists and also your health, because I'm sure people care deeply about where the story goes next. <laughs> Well, we're here. <laughs> I know that's the key. Every day, creating, uh, continuing to do what we do and make beauty in a world where there's always need of more of it. You know, I, I'm a uh, that's just what what we do and so like I learn from my every day, so there could be anything coming. It could be uh <laughs> could be a book or it could be a, 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 a reinstatement of the circus. She could build her own empire, she could fly fly planes. It, it, it could be anything. So I, I think that that's the beauty of a creative life. We have so much in store, so much to come. And that's how we live, and no matter what. And I'll just add one small thing to that. You know, we talk in the film about survival really being its own kind of creative act. And I learned this the first time I was sick when I was 22, um, which is, you know, there's a temptation to hold on to the past, to hold on to who you were, to your plans for the future. And when the ceiling takes in, that isn't always possible. And trying to hold to those things is a recipe for defeat and endless frustration. And I believe that we're all creative, it doesn't matter if your paycheck is tied to creative output or not, but that there's value and creative process because what it's shown me time and time again and I know it's shown you John is that in these moments where everything is upended you have an opportunity to reimagine who you are to reimagine how you relate to the world and how you're going to move forward with it and so that's what we're continuing to do. Thank you so much and thanks for having me.